At the beginning of the year, we talked about matter and broke it into different categories. One of the ways we broke matter into categories was to talk about the different phases of matter. And we focused on solids, liquids, and gases and described them. We looked at differentiation between the properties of solids, liquids, and gases. In this unit, we're going to focus specifically on gases. As a reminder, we described gases as having particles that are far apart from each other and that they didn't have any definite shape or volume, which means that they can conform to the shape or the volume of the container. The text also describes gas particles as being very compressible. If we were to look at a sample of gas, by definition the particles would be far apart from each other. So that means there's a lot of empty space between particles, so if you squeeze them together there is space for them to move into. Likewise, the particles like to be apart, so by spreading them out, they're very comfortable to spread out and fill up an even larger volume of a container. This would be why if you opened an oven that was baking chocolate chip cookies, the gas particles leaving the oven will eventually fill the entire kitchen, and you can smell the chocolate chip cookies everywhere in the kitchen. Solids and liquids, by definition, have particles that are very close to each other, so there's no space for the particles to squeeze in even tighter. And because the particles are close together, they actually attract each other. It's very difficult to make them expand and take up even larger space. The behavior of gases is defined by something called kinetic molecular theory. Now, there's a lot in this, but it's something that we're going to be referring to pretty constantly through this unit. So I'm going to run through it now, but then I'm going to refer back to it throughout this unit. There are six parts to kinetic molecular theory. The first is one that we've already discussed. We said, by definition, gas particles are very, very, very small. A corollary to this is also something that we discussed. There is a large distance between gas particles. In fact, if you were to look at a gas, almost all of the volume of the gas is made up of the empty space between the particles, not the particles themselves. So another way to say that is when measuring a sample of gas, the volume of the particles in the gas is negligible. Really, all of the volume is composed of the empty space between them. Gas particles are in constant motion, and to be specific, it's a constant random linear motion. The particles don't swirl around, they just travel in straight lines until they hit something, bounce, and then they'll move in a straight line until they hit something and bounce. The next one is kind of a physics definition. Gas particles, when they do collide, either with each other or with the walls of a container, they collide elastically. And the geeky way to define that is to say that they conserve kinetic energy. But in practicality, it just means that when a gas particle hits another particle or hits the wall of a container, it's not going to slow down. It's just going to bounce off and keep on going. The next part has to do with the definition of temperature. Temperature is defined as the average kinetic energy of a substance. When you're measuring temperature, you're measuring how much kinetic energy the particles in that sample have. And then the last part of kinetic molecular theory will play a role later in this unit as well. We say that gas particles do not exert any force on each other. They don't attract each other, nor do they repel each other. They just kind of exist in their own space. I know that's a lot, but we're going to see it over and over again. Hopefully you become pretty comfortable with this. The main topic I want to talk about in this video is the concept of measuring gases. Now when we measure gases, there are four different types of measurements we can take, and we'll be doing some combination of these four throughout this unit. The four measurements that we're going to concern ourselves with are the volume of gases, their temperature, how much gas is present, and how much pressure is the gas exerted. Volume is something that we've been talking about. We did a whole density lab with volume, and it's a measurement that you've been taking for years. In an equation, you'll see a variable as a capital V for volume. And when we measure volume, we measure it in liters or milliliters. Sometimes you'll see cubic centimeters, or cc's, which is another abbreviation for a cubic centimeter. Milliliters, cubic centimeters, and cc are all the same unit. They all measure the same volume. So you can use milliliters, cubic centimeters, and cc's interchangeably. A liter is a thousand times bigger. There are a thousand milliliters in a liter. When you see a capital T in an equation, that will refer to temperature. And we saw that in the last unit when we did Q equals MC delta T. So we recognize that variable as measuring temperature. When we measure temperature in this class, we don't use Fahrenheit. We will use degrees Celsius, or in this unit, we're going to use Kelvin a lot. 
Now we talked about Kelvin previously in the year, but I'll refresh our memory here. When we think of a thermometer, we can measure in a number of different units, but there are three common ones. On the left, you see the Fahrenheit scale. And I said already, we're not going to worry about Fahrenheit. It's not a measurement that we're going to take in this class. The ones that are more commonly used in this class are Celsius and Kelvin. So let's focus in on those. Now a unit of Celsius and a unit of Kelvin are actually the same size unit. So as you look at this diagram, the difference between the freezing point and the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius or 100 Kelvin. So it's 100 steps either way, which means that each unit is the same size step. What differentiates Celsius and Kelvin is where they call zero. So zero Kelvin is absolute zero. It's the coldest possible temperature. Zero Celsius is the freezing point of water. So we are very comfortable with having negative degrees Celsius. We've dealt with these just as recently as two weeks ago. The conversion factor from Celsius to Kelvin is 273. The text uses 273.15, but 273 is fine. So if we want to go from Celsius to Kelvin, you have to add 273 to your number. If you go from Kelvin to Celsius, you have to subtract 273 from your number. And as a way to check, there's no such thing as a negative Kelvin. Zero Kelvin is absolute zero. It's the coldest possible temperature. We do have negative Celsius, though, so that's OK in a calculation. So if I have a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius, what would that be in Kelvin? Well, to go from Celsius to Kelvin, you add 273. So 25 degrees Celsius is equivalent to 298 Kelvin. And if I have a temperature of 155 Kelvin, what is that in Celsius? Well, to go from Kelvin to Celsius, you have to subtract 273. So that would be equivalent to negative 118 degrees Celsius. Again, negative Celsius is OK. Negative Kelvin is not. OK, so that gets us halfway through our measurements. The next one is the amount of gas. The variable that you're going to see when talking about amount of gas is a lowercase n. Again, we're running out of letters. I guess you can say there is an n in amount, but I don't know why they chose an n. The units, however, are important. When we measure the amount of gas, we're not going to measure the mass. We always measure the moles of gas. So in this unit, it's always going to be important to make sure that your amounts are in moles. So volume, temperature, and moles, these are all measurements that we've dealt with before. There's nothing new here. The one we haven't talked about is pressure. Pressure will have a capital P in an equation. And there are all sorts of units for pressure. There are ATM, which means atmospheres, PSI, pounds per square inch, MM of HG, that's a mouthful, that's a millimeters of mercury, TOR is another unit, and then PA is short for Pascal. Pascal is the SI unit of pressure, but we actually don't use it very much in this class. We're going to focus on atmospheres, millimeters of mercury, and TOR. So before we do that, let's talk a little bit about pressure. Pressure is defined as the force being applied over a unit of area. So you can apply a great deal of pressure by squeezing with a large force or by applying the force over a very small area. This is why people are told if they're on a frozen pond or a frozen body of water and they hear it cracking underneath your feet, you're actually instructed to lie down flat on the ice. This seems counterintuitive. You're actually getting yourself closer to death. But by lying down on the ice, you're increasing the surface area of your body. And if you increase the area, then what you're going to do is decrease the pressure. Now for gases, it's the gas particles moving around and colliding with the walls of whatever is containing them. That's what causes pressure. So the more collisions you have, the more pressure you'll have the more forceful the collisions, the more pressure you have. The smaller area that's being applied, however, will also increase the pressure. So it's important to remember what the definition of pressure is, force over area. 
And it's also important to remember what's causing the pressure when we talk about gases. Pressure is always caused by the collisions of the gas particles with the container. Now I said there are a number of different units and the text has a table that shows you the conversion factors between the different units. One of the first who was able to take very careful measurements of gas pressure was a gentleman named Evangelista Torricelli. Torricelli is credited with creating one of the world's first barometers. And what he did is he filled up a tube with mercury and the tube was sealed at one end. It was kind of like a long test tube. And Torricelli filled that with mercury and then had another dish of mercury underneath and then tipped the tube upside down and quickly stuck it into the dish of mercury. What would happen is some of the mercury would flow out of the tube but the rest would stay in. The air pressure surrounding Torricelli would force the mercury up the tube and keep it at a certain height. This is very similar to you sitting in a restaurant waiting for your food to come and playing with the straw in your drink. As you put your finger over the top you seal one end of the tube and then you can actually pick the liquid up over the surface of the drink because air pressure will push that liquid up the straw. As you remove your finger you equalize the pressure both inside and outside of the straw and so the liquid drops back down to the surface. Torricelli was basically doing this experiment but with mercury instead of a soda. And what Torricelli came to discover is that as he moved this barometer to different places, so in this diorama here he is apparently standing in the Italian Alps, he saw that the height of the mercury column would change. So down in Venice at sea level the mercury column was taller than up in the mountains. Why? Because there's more air pressure down closer to the surface of the earth than there is up high in the mountains. An important measurement that Torricelli made was that at sea level his level of mercury was 760 millimeters tall. So we refer to that as normal atmospheric pressure, the pressure at sea level. When we look at this chart you can see from the chart that one atmosphere of pressure is exactly equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. Millimeters of mercury is referring to the Torricelli experiment. You can also see that one atmosphere of pressure is exactly equivalent to 760 tor. A tor and a millimeter of mercury are the same unit. It's just that a millimeter of mercury is a mouthful to say and so we shorten it by saying tor. So let's try a little bit of practice. Let's say I have 1.22 atmospheres of pressure and I want that measurement of pressure expressed in the units of millimeters of mercury. This one is pretty straightforward. The key is that you remember that one atmosphere is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. If we're starting with 1.22 atmospheres, then our conversion factor, well, I can do 1 atmosphere over 760 millimeters or 760 millimeters over 1 atmosphere. I'm going to put the millimeters of mercury on top. And then I'm going to divide it by 1 atmosphere. And so my atmospheres cancel out. And when I solve this, I get 927 millimeters of mercury.